was a copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. California Highway Patrol calling all cars. Attention all cars broadcast 283 regarding a hit and run driver. Assist the officers of Laguna Beach. That's all. Rose and Quinn. Grande dealers in the morning for some Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Have him drain off the sluggish winter weight oil you've been using and put in a crank capable of summer grade Rio Lube or Rio Grande Pennsylvania. And don't stop there. Get a Rio Tech lubrication job from bumper to bumper. Really put the car in tip top shape for at least 5,000 miles of warm weather driving. You're going to expect and demand a lot from that automobile of yours this summer. And if you take my tip, you'll avoid disappointment and possibly some disastrous repair bill. Yes, friends, old man winter has checked out. Summer has definitely checked in. And a real check lubrication job is the best kind of wear-free, care-free, economical, enjoyable motoring. Better have it done in the morning when you drop around for that tank full of police car performance, Rio Grande Crack, the most highly recommended gasoline sold in the West. The facts around which tonight's story have been built have been taken from the confidential files of the California Highway Patrol and from the personal experiences of the officers involved. It is our pleasure, therefore, to welcome again Chief of the Highway Patrol, E. Raymond Cato. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The general public usually think of the Highway Patrol officer as a man who rides a motorcycle and hands out tickets for traffic violations. To many, he is such an org, but only to the law violator. The highway patrolman is a man who has been carefully trained. In many instances, his work is as interesting and difficult as that of any detective of fiction. The highway patrol officer may not always be a brilliant detective, but he is an efficient officer and an honest one, and an officer who is determined to do his work and to prove that regardless of its nature, Crime of any sort is a losing game. How some of the men of my department, aided by the officers of the district in which they worked, brought this fact home to a law violator, we shall see as our program progresses. Our story opens in the offices of the coroner of Orange County. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's get started. The jury understands its duties, I think, so we can get on with the testimony. Our first witness is Mr. James. Mr. James here? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. James, have you seen the body of the deceased? Yes, sir. You have identified it? Yes, sir. It is the body of my son. When did you last see your son alive? On the morning of November 10th. And uh, where was your son at that time? He was preparing to leave for school. Did he go alone? No, sir. I went with him as far as Laguna Beach. Well, Billy, this is the end of the line for you. Okay, Dad. I'll see you sometime tonight. Now, don't be late. Oh, I won't. I'm going to the football game with Don, and as soon as it's over, we'll ride home on his bike. I don't like this idea of you two youngsters riding on one bicycle. Oh, Dad, it's all right. I always ride on the back. I never ride on the handlebars. Well, stay off the main highway if it's dark when you start home. It's hard to see a couple of kids on a bicycle. Oh, it'll be all right, Dad. We'll be careful. Besides, Don's got a red reflector on his bicycle. You can see it a quarter of a mile away. All right, son. Supper will be waiting. So I left him close to the school in Laguna Beach. 
When did you next see your son? That night, about six o'clock. At the hospital. He was dead. That's all, Mr. James. Officer Adams. Yes, sir. Uh, you investigated this case for the highway patrol, didn't you? Yes, sir. As a member of that department, I was notified of the accident by Officer Sawyer, who was on duty at the highway patrol office at Orange, near Santa Ana. At uh, what time was this? Well, the broadcast about the accident was put on the radio at 5.57 on the evening of November 10th, 1937. And uh, were you on duty that time? No, sir. I was at home. Officer Sawyer called me to go on the case with him. Why did he do that? Well, he was going on his vacation next day. It would have been necessary to turn any data he got over to someone else. So he forestalled any difficulty along that line by calling me to go with him. I see. Uh, tell us what investigation you made in connection with this case. I went down to Laguna with Sawyer. We contacted Officer Jack Blakeney of the Laguna Beach Police Department. He had responded to a call about an accident. Hello, Blakeney. What have you found out? Yeah, not much. Pretty hard to get any dope on the case. You know Sawyer here? Yeah? Oh, yeah, sure. How are you, Sawyer? Fine. Uh, anybody see the accident? Well, not exactly, so far as we can find out. This fellow here was the one who called up. His name's Forsyth, I believe. You see the accident? No, sir, I didn't see it. I was sitting up there by the signboard eating my supper. Uh, what do you do for a living? Well, you see, uh, huh? Oh, uh, well, I sort of do whatever I can find to do. Right now, I'm just passing through on my way to San Diego. I see. Well, what about the accident? Well, I just lit a cigarette, and I saw the two boys on the bicycle going along the road. That way. South. Uh, both on the same bicycle? Yes. One of them was on the luggage carrier. He was the boy who was killed. And what happened then? Well, you see, I was back away from the bank here, and uh, when the boys got right about here, they disappeared for a second or two. Close to the bank here or out in the road? They were right up against the bank. One of the boys was sort of pushing along with his foot. They were so close to the side of the cut, I couldn't see them for a little while, and then I heard this car... Look out! that was driving opened the door and looked out. Then he shot the car in gear and drove off as fast as he could turn a wheel. What kind of a car was it? I don't know. Except that it was a black sedan with one taillight. Mm, I was told by a couple of people who came along just about the time the accident occurred that the car had two taillights. I can't help what they told you. It didn't have but one light on the back. You're sure about that? Positive. It's pretty important because it might be a clue to the year model of the car. Well, I'm positive that the car had only one taillight. Besides, somewhere around here, you're going to find some glass. Because I heard glass drop on the highway just after the crash. Yeah, I just picked up some glass over here, Adams. Fine, keep it. We'll try to find out what kind of a car it was from the glass. Now, let's barricade this section of the highway so we can look it over in the daylight tomorrow. we better get over to the hospital now. That was about all we were able to do that night, Mr. Coroner. Uh, when did you continue the investigation? Well, next day, Sergeant Peterkin from the highway patrol office went down to Laguna Beach with me. Sawyer had gone on his vacation. Well, Blakeney, what'd you find out about that accident case? Eh, not much so far. Is this the place where the boys were struck? Yes, Sergeant. Here's the place where we found the bicycle. And back here is where it looks as though they may have been struck. I found this piece of headlight lens just off the pavement here this morning. And there are several good-sized pieces of windshield glass we found. Hmm. Looks like the car was clear off the highway and out here in the shoulder. We had every officer in this part of the county on the job last night. Inside of 30 minutes, we had every road blocked. The bird who did this must still be in the district, or we didn't have to. Well, we'll get him eventually. Adams, uh, let's take a few measurements of the highway here. Okay. Let's get the distance from the other side of the pavement first. Here's the tape. Okay, what have you got? 30 feet. Now let's measure this with the macadamized section on this side of the road. Okay. Uh, six feet. That makes 36 feet altogether. Now over the shoulder between the macadam and the bank there. That's 10 feet. Mm-hmm. That gives us 46 feet. Uh, it looks like a guy would be able to drive past a couple of kids on a bicycle in that much space. Hey, wait a minute. Here's some tracks on the shoulder here. Those look like fresh tracks. Yeah. Here's indication that a car has kicked up the dirt, making a fast getaway. That fellow Forsythe said the car drove away at high speed. Now, wait a minute. Let me get this camera focused on that tire tracker. I want to get a cross light on it to bring out the tread. Oh. 
I'd say it was a a general. I think so, too. Get back a little, will you? Adams are throwing a shadow. Sure. Looks like this might be a right front tire. Yeah, I think it is. Mighty close to the bank, too. The only thing I can figure on this is either that the driver saw the boys too late and tried to dodge, or else he was rounding that curve too fast to stay on the road. Well, that curve's not sharp enough for that. And besides, it's practically straightened out by the time you get to this point. That track's barely visible, you know that? Think you can get a picture of it? Oh, I already got it. The next thing you do is try to find out what kind of a car this headlight lens came from. It looks like it might have been a Chevrolet. Look here, you see, uh, see this edge here where it fits under the headlight rim? Mm-hmm. Doesn't that look like a CH to you? Yeah, it does a little. This is a curved glass, you know. Yeah, and the new Chevy has a definitely curved lens. You've uh, got those pieces of windshield down at your office, haven't you, Blakeney? Yes, we picked them up last night. Well, looks like about all we can do here. What next? We better get out to that boy's house and get some pictures of the bicycle. Then we can try to find out about that car. Well, let me start looking for a matching headlight lens while you fellows get the pictures of the bicycle. Good idea. We'll meet you at your office later. Well, Blakeney, what'd you learn? Well, the glass we've got is from a 1936 Chevrolet. How'd you find out? I made the rounds of all the automobile dealers here and in San Clemente. No other car had lenses like these uh, pieces except that model. Has the same curvature and the ridges on the glass are the same. Besides, I found that all the edges of the lenses are marked like the piece we have here. You think we can start looking for a black Chevrolet sedan, do you? I've already started looking. I've got a list of every car of that type that's been sold in this district within the past two years, uh, just in case it might be an older model. We can start running them down. Did you find out if the 36 Chevy has one or two taillights? One. That bears out Forsyth's statement. What did, uh, what did you find out about the bicycle? When we find the car, we'll find somewhere on it a mark of a rubber handlebar. One handlebar grip was damaged. Mm. Was the bike hit from the rear? Uh, apparently, the handlebar was struck first, and the front wheel knocked into the car. It was damaged quite badly. Doesn't look as if the bicycle was struck squarely from the back. The boys were probably knocked into the car when it struck the handlebar. Then we should look for a black Chevrolet sedan, 1936 model, one tail light, and the head left headlight shattered. And with a general tire on the right front wheel. And don't forget a broken windshield. In that case, there'll probably be blood. Probably. Well... We're going to have to leave it up to you boys of the highway patrol. The accident occurred outside the city limits, and unless we find the driver in town, there isn't much in the way of jurisdiction we can claim. That's okay with us. We'll take care of it. Don't worry. Meantime, though, I'll keep checking on all the black sedans in town. Maybe one of them will turn up with something. Following his plan, Blakeney checked all cars in the vicinity of Laguna Beach, San Clemente and surrounding towns searching for a black sedan bearing evidence of a recent accident. With officers constantly on the alert, it seemed impossible that the killer car could escape. Yet not a clue was uncovered and no trace of the driver could be found. Impossible as it seemed, an automobile and its driver had completely disappeared. Then, several nights later, Officer Jim Holcomb was on duty in the Orange County office of the Highway Patrol when two men entered. I'm Mr. Jones. I represent an insurance company that has a policy with Mr. Walsh here. We've had an accident, and we felt that it should be reported to you. I see. What sort of an accident was it? Well, that's the point. Uh, do we have to talk out here? Well, you can go into that office there. I'll be with you in just a second. All right, thanks. All right, now, just read that green set of letters. Hey, I, I don't think we should have come here. I do. Well, after all, this isn't an accident that the highway patrol would be interested in. Now, gentlemen... Sorry to have kept you waiting like this, but I had to give that man an eye test. That's all right. We've got plenty of time. You um, want to make an accident report, is that right? Yes. Okay. Where did the accident happen? On the highway, just outside of Laguna Beach. Laguna Beach, yeah? When? Uh, Last Wednesday, late in the afternoon. Anybody injured? Well, uh, uh, no, no. I see. What time did the accident occur? Well, uh, well, that is, well, I, I don't remember. What? You don't remember? No. Wait a minute. What is this? Well, I don't have to answer your fool questions. Hold on, young fellow. I didn't bring you in here. You came in of your own free will. Oh, no, I didn't. He made me do it. Now, take it easy, Mr. Walsh. Did you say no one was injured in this accident? No. Pardon me a moment. Mr. Adams, will you come in here a second, please? Sure. What's on your mind, Hawkum? I've been trying to make out this accident report here, and the man involved seems to be a little confused about things. 
I think you'd better ask him a few questions. Okay, which one is it? This man, his name's Walsh. This is Mr. Jones, his insurance adjuster. How do you do? Mm -hmm. Now, what about this accident? Well, this morning, Mr. Walsh came into the office and reported that he'd been in an accident of some sort, and his windshield had been broken. What kind of an accident? He said the pelican had struck his windshield and had broken it. Pelican? Yes. Is that the way you got your face all cut up? Yes. Been to a doctor? No. What are you so belligerent about? I, I don't mean to be. Had no medical treatment, huh? No. What time was the accident? He said he didn't know. What's that? Well, I don't know exactly. It was sometime between 4 and 5 o'clock on Wednesday. Where? Just outside the city limits of Laguna Beach. Where? Laguna Beach. I see. Where's the car now? It's in Mr. Walsh's garage. And that's where? In San Clemente. San Clemente, huh? I might have known that. Big what? I was just thinking out loud. Well, may I go now? Well, of course, if you want to. But I'd like to take a look at that car if you don't well, mind. Well, I... Of course, officer. Here's the address. Thanks. Walsh, you'd better stay here till I get back. Well, why? I haven't broken any law. Maybe you're right. Anyway, you'd better get that face fixed up. Holcomb can get a doctor to take care of you. You stick around. I won't be gone long. <laughs> Confident that Walsh was concealing something regarding his accident, but not wishing to frighten him, Adams contacted Sergeant Peterson. Next morning, armed with complete photographic equipment, the officers went to the address Walsh had given them. This is the place, all right. Mm. I think I'll get a picture of that driveway. Okay. Okay, got it. Look, in the driveway there. What does that look like to you? Blood spots. Better shoot them, huh? Yeah. Okay. They lead directly to the garage door. Let's take a look inside. Here's a place where somebody stood for a while. Quite a blood spot there. Yeah, no blood on the door. That's funny. Maybe there was somebody else with Walsh. You're assuming that the blood spots were made by Walsh. I'm pretty sure of it. A man's face bleeds pretty profusely. Oh, take a look at the back of that car. Well, the whole back end's caved in. That doesn't make sense. Well, no. This car's been struck from the rear. Maybe Walsh is not the man we're after. It's beginning to look that way. Yeah, yeah, a lot of bloody handprints in the back of the car. Somebody must have pushed it in here. Yeah, back it out a little so I can get some light on it. I want to take a picture of it. Well, the ignition's locked. Maybe we can get it out with the starter. Yeah, no go. Car's in low and the battery is dead. Yeah, we can push it out. Okay, here we go. All right, get the brake. For the love of Mike, take a look at the blood on that car inside. Yeah, all over the windows and the back seat. Front all stain of blood, too. Something did knock that windshield out. Must have cut the driver up pretty bad. Judging from the horizontal streaks of blood, I'd say whoever was driving went away from there at high speed. Yeah. It doesn't make sense that a man who was just a pelican would drive like that unless he was going to a doctor. And Walsh didn't go to a doctor. Hey. Hey, here's the reason he had to push the car. Take a look at that gas tank. Ah, been cut practically in two, hasn't it? Yeah. It's so hard that the edge is curled up enough to save a little gasoline. I wonder how far away that happened. Somewhere up the hill, I imagine. The car would coast down to here. Yeah, and he uh, would have had to push it up the driveway because the turn's too sharp to coast in. Yeah, there's a long four and a half cut on the actual housing. Wait a minute. What's this on the back of the car, this uh, sticky stuff? Looks like tar or pitch. Mm-hmm. That's just what it is. Look at him. This car hasn't been run into. It's been backed into something. You got something there. I wonder what Walsh could have backed into to cause this much damage. In a way, he didn't mention this damage in his report. That's right. I wonder why. Oh, I forgot it, maybe. I doubt that. A man wouldn't forget about having to coast half a mile out of gas and then push his car up this incline. Yeah, not very likely. I wonder who Walsh had in the car with him. That's something else he'll have to explain. Yeah, got your pictures yet? Not all of them. I'll measure these cuts. Uh, get the distance along the axle where that deep cut is and how high from the ground. Okay. Now yeah, we'll just get a shot or two of these bloodstained windows. Yeah. That's it. You know something? I think we'd better get in touch with Chief Lovell. After all, this is a San Clemente resident. Besides, I've got a hunch how that back end got caved in, and I think the Chief can help us. Okay, let's go after him. We can get the rest of the pictures later. Chief Wendell Lovell of San Clemente immediately cooperated with the highway patrol officers 
The suspected car was towed to the police garage, and the officers returned with the chief to inspect Walsh's home. They were admitted by a servant. Our, our face is going to be red if he's not the man we think he is. I don't have much doubt about it. You'll have to admit you'll have a hard time explaining the back end of that car if you're going to accuse the man of hitting somebody. I don't think we haven't thought of that, do you? Well, judging from this bedroom, I'd say Mr. Walsh spent the night of November 10th in this room. I'm afraid you're right there. Must have been cut pretty badly to have left that much stain. You should see him. That settles the question of whether he stayed here that night. I still wonder why he didn't see a doctor about those cuts. Lovell, I've got an idea about the back end of that car. I've been thinking a lot about it. What's your theory? Well, in the first place, the direction of that cut on the axle indicates that the car was backing up. Mm, might have been. A gas tank indicates the same thing. Don't forget the pitch on the trunk cover. That car has been backed into a post or a projecting object of some kind, something that could have been broken off and uh, would have left a jagged edge. Such as a concrete lamp post with a metal base. That's oh. it. Wait a minute. What about the car or pitch or whatever it was? Well, sometimes when the posts get cracked, they're patched with a black cement that looks like pitch. So all we've got to do is find a knockdown lamp post in San Clemente, and we can backtrack on Walt. Well, that's not so difficult. Not for you, maybe. And I couldn't find my way around the streets of this town with a police escort. <laughs> <laughs> well, all we've got to do is go back to the scene of the accident and drive into San Clemente and figure the shortest way to get to this spot. Just like that. Just like that. Well, let's do it. Okay, boys. If my figuring's right, here's where Walt could turn off to get to his house. Well, it's your town. You should know the streets. Let's see what happens. You see, this street goes downhill for a little right here. I don't see how this could be right. Oh, wait a minute. We make a turn right here. Yeah, we're still a long way from Walsh's place. Oh, not as far as you think. It's just over the hill, but we have to make a left turn. Hey, wait a minute. What's up? You see that uh, trail of gas or oil leading up there? Yes, but that's a dead-end street. Let's go up there. Okay, by me. There it is. There's your broken lamppost. Hmm. All right, boys. There's your answer to the smashed-up back end on Mr. Walsh's car. He drove down here, came too fast to make that turn into his street. And found himself on this dead-end street. And tried to turn around. Yeah, that's when he backed over the curb and hit this lamppost. Grab the end of this tape, Adams. Got it. Hold it on that uh, tire mark right there. Hey, this is the same kind of tire that's on Walsh's car. So I noticed. What do you got? Well, the distance from this jagged piece of this lamppost base to the tire mark is exactly the same as the distance the cut on the axle housing is from the wheel. So you figure this is the place Walsh backs his car into the lamppost. That's right. He came up here, saw he was in a dead-end street, shot his car into reverse, and crashed into this post. Well, you can see a trail of gasoline all the way down the hill and up to the top. Mm. From there, he would be able to coast all the way to his house. Boy, he must have been scared. I guess the wicked flee when no man pursueth. Well, from now on, he's going to be pursued and hotly. <laughs> Returning to the San Clemente Police Garage, Officers Adams and Sergeant Peterkin continue their inspection of the damaged car. I think it's about time we took a look at that uh, front end of this car, Chief. Oh, I don't think there's much doubt now that this was the car involved in that hit-and-run accident. Well, anyway, we've got a charge of damaging city property against Walsh, if nothing else. Adams, uh, take a look at that right front tire. Mm-hmm. Same as the print we found the dirt where the boy was killed. Mm-hmm. Remember that uh, handlebar on the bicycle? The one on the left side was broken? Yeah. See that mark on the radiator shell? Yeah. It was made by rubber, and it's the same height from the ground as the handlebar grip on the bicycle. You must have struck the handlebar first and then probably threw the boy up over the hood and into the windshield. That's right. That's undoubtedly when those dents were made in the front fender and when the headlight lens was broken. Here's some pieces of the lens we found when we brought the car in. Let's see if they fit the ones Blakeney picked up at the scene of the accident. Yeah, they fit all right. Mm-hmm. Now to see if the piece of windshield we found fits the hole in this one. Yeah, that fits, too. This is the right car, all right. If we can prove that Walsh was driving it, we've got a case. 
Well, circumstantial evidence is pretty heavy that he was driver. Mm, he admits he was driving the car that night, the tent. Yeah, he admits it now, yeah, but uh, who knows what kind of a story he'll tell when he finds a hit-and-run rap staring him in the face. Well, it's pretty evident that Walsh got himself cut up somewhere, and this blood didn't get on the inside of the car from a pelican. Well, that's probably true, but you're going to have to prove it to a jury. I don't think so. I think that when we tell Mr. Walsh what we know about this case, he'll change his story about that pelican. <laughs> This is Sergeant Peterkin. We've been looking over that car of yours. Oh, then you know you haven't any right to keep me here. I demand that you release me. Now, oh, wait a minute, Mr. Walsh. You're not charged with anything yet, and we haven't had you under arrest. But from now on, that's just what's happening to you. You're staying here till we take you to the county jail. Well, what's the charge? You're being held for the death of that little James boy who was killed in Laguna Beach Wednesday night. Oh, well, what's that got to do with me? We can enlighten you a little on that, I believe, though... We'd rather you told us about it. Oh, this is ridiculous. Maybe it is, but just the same, we're convinced that you drove the car that hit those two boys and killed one of them. And sent the other one to the hospital. And you didn't stop to see how badly you hurt either of them. You were either uh, too scared or not human enough to act like a man when you hit those youngsters. So you drove off and left them lying there in the highway. Stop it! All this is nonsense. I don't know what you're talking about. Walsh, uh, how'd the windshield of your car get broken? Oh, I told you. A pelican flew into it. Where's the pelican? But, well... Well, that is, uh... Well? Uh, it fell off onto the road. How far did you drive it after the bird hit your car? Uh, all the way home. What speed? I don't remember. Fast? Maybe I did. Which way did you go? Well, I took a shortcut to my home in San Clemente. How'd the back end of your car get smashed up? What? I said, uh, how'd the back end of your car get smashed up? Uh, I don't remember. You remember a pelican hitting your windshield, the glass cutting up your face. You remember driving home and into your garage. But you don't remember how the rear end of your car got torn up. You expect us to believe that? I don't give a hang what you believe. I think I can refresh your memory for you, Mr. Walsh. Uh, yes? Yes. You left Laguna Beach just before dark Wednesday night. You may have been drinking. I don't know. I don't say you were. But you drove along the highway just beyond La Granita. And you weren't being too careful because you didn't notice two boys on a bicycle in front of you. As a matter of fact, you were clear over on the unpaved portion of the highway where the boys on their bicycle were traveling. You didn't pay any attention to the boys. You didn't see the red reflector on the back of their bicycle. You crashed into that bicycle and you killed one of those boys. I stopped. Yeah. Yeah, you stopped. Opened your car door and looked back. You saw those torn and bleeding bodies lying there on the pavement. No. You didn't know nor care whether they were dead or alive. No, no. You let panic seize you. You shot your car into gear and drove as fast as you could. You were running away. No, no, I didn't. You tried to make a turn into your own street. You couldn't make it. Saw you were in a jam. You backed up. Too fast. You crashed your car into a lamppost and broke it off. That's when you tore up the back end of your car. You didn't know it then, but your gas tank was torn and your gasoline all ran out. Your engine stopped. But you coasted at home. You used the starter to help you get the car in the And somebody helped you. No! Out. Then you shoved the car into the garage and slammed the doors and locked them. And then you had time to think. Please! Please! I didn't kill him. I didn't mean to. I was too afraid to go back and see if he was dead. I couldn't bear to look at him. I couldn't bear it. Okay, Walsh, take it easy. We'll stand on what we've got. In just a moment, we shall hear the concluding facts regarding our program. It's one thing to acquire new customers, another to keep old ones. Rio Grande does both, friends, because our petroleum products really speak for themselves. All we need to do is persuade a motorist to try Rio Grande cracked gasoline and Rio Lube motor oil once, and he belongs to the family for life. So I invite anyone who has not done so to expose his car to the benefits of Rio Grande petroleum products and judge for himself. Presented with the results of the Highway Patrol officer's deduction, Walsh confessed and pleaded guilty and is now serving his time in San Quentin, a tribute to the efficiency of the Highway Patrol.
California Highway Patrol calling on all cars, attention all cars, to cancellation of broadcast 283 regarding a hit and run driver. Suspects in this case are now in custody. That's all. Roll. Frederick Lindsay, bidding you good night for Rio Grande. Next week at this time, Rio Grande will present the Gospel of Brother Ned. This is the Columbus.